So Jamie is the author of Stealing Fire. His new book, Recapture the Rapture, is coming out in April. And Jamie is amazing at taking um, what might be thought of as esoteric ideas of transformation, um, group flow, and make it and turning them into something really aspirational and really of the moment. We're going to start with Nick Shaw. Hi, Jamie. It's nice to see you. Um, nice to and great, nice to see everybody. So, <clears throat> I just my questions was based on I was watching the Scientology documentary for a while on Netflix. And I was particularly fascinated by listening to people that had come out of that cult, you know, and been deprogrammed and were several years later and we were talking about, wow, I can't believe how completely my worldview was shaped by being inside that cult. And now, if, you know, I can see what I was in and now I'm out as if to pop out of the matrix. And I was wondering if you thought that that's true kind of on a mass level about civilization right now. Like, I feel like there's a bit of that going on, say, for example, in Rebel Wisdom, where people are saying, like, shit, I was so programmed by the culture that I was part of, just mainstream culture, and now I'm starting to feel like I'm getting disembedded from the matrix. Do you think, like, culture's kind of like a cult? <laughs> I guess that was my question. Is it, is it displaying some of those characteristics, mainstream culture, it's like a cult? Yeah, that, <clears throat> that is a super interesting question. I mean, I think the simplest thing is we are experiencing an epistemic collapse right now. And it is due in large part to the collapse of the two big handholds that we've had for the last thousands of years to a few centuries, which is traditional meaning in the form of organized religion. And we've seen you know, the Pew Research Fund and all these folks showing the uh, you know rise of the nuns or the spiritual but not religious. The unaffiliated is now the largest and fastest growing group of religious um, you know adherents in, in at least in the US and Western Europe and sort of cascading around the world. So we've had a collapse in organized religion. And at the same time, we, and that's sort of meaning 1.0. And we've also had a collapse in meaning 2.0, which you could make a case is the kind of post enlightenment liberal experiment of civil liberties, everyone's entitled to, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, regardless of race, color, or creed, all men and women are created equal. That general jam. And now we're seeing the sense of like, wait a second, NAFTA, wait a second, the 1%, wait a second, Occupy, wait a second, you know, <clears throat> social justice protest and environmental collapse, that whole idea of rising tides, lifting all boats, we've fucking got, you know, sold a bill of goods, and we're no longer buying into it, we're no longer behave nicely and wait for our time for, our, you know, our line, our turn in line. So in the collapse of meaning 1.0, in that vacuum, you get people getting sucked to fundamentalism. And in the collapse of meaning 2.0, you know, you kind of get fight club, you get nihilism. And, and that's where we're getting a, a real pull in the extremes from this epistemic collapse. If what we were told, if the WHO and the CDC and the president of the United States are no longer trustworthy narrators, and we don't have a Walter Cronkite or even a Dan Rather anymore. And instead, we've got Breitbart and OAN and Fox and MSNBC and all these things. We're having a collapse in benign authority. And what that's leaving, and, and we used to use benign authority as a massive fucking shortcut for our own sense making. Right? We, used to, we used to defer to good opinion. Well, how would Martha Stewart set the table? Or how does the queen draw her tea? Right? And that, that is how one does it, doesn't one? And so we, we absolutely were able to offload shit piles of being the complex part of being a monkey with clothes. And now that that, that epistemic collapse and the loss of <clears throat> benign authority all around us, and this goes for Ivy League universities taking bribes and kickouts, MIT Media Labs taking money from Jeffrey Epstein, right? The doctors who prescribed our kids Adderall and got everybody addicted to OxyContin, the white-coated physician, at first do no harm, you know, governments, you know, banks, the fact that McKinsey and Goldman are responsible for more state capture in South Africa, in the 1MDB crisis in Singapore, all over the place, right? The best manicured hands are in the cookie jar. And so that's just what's happening around us. And then take a look at the content that we're facing, which is judging multiple intersecting exponential chaotic curves and trying to predict a goddamn thing about what's going to happen next. Right, so that's super hard to map and model for most folks. Really, for anybody ever, the only the cardinal error is false certainty. You know, the, the more people know that space, the more you're like, it's going to be an adapt and respond kind of situation. And actually, you know, our colleague and and 
co-leader of the Flow Genome Project, Kurt Cronin, is a SEAL Team 6 commander who spent his time with JSOC and in, in Yemen and a bunch of other places. And that's exactly how they do it. You train your ass off and you know nothing goes according to plan. So in the absence of certainty, we are clinging off and we are lunging for false certainty. And that's where you see everything from QAnon to pandemic, which is the world doesn't make sense. I deeply suspect I've been sold a bill of goods, but I'm not quite sure who sold it to me or when I sold my soul for it. Um, but I will grab onto any coherent meta narrative that, it, that presumes or insists that it explains it all. And then that leads to a subsur it's basically a yielding of sovereignty. I'm giving up my own discernment, common sense, bullshit detector. I am bestowing epistemic authority on some potential fuckwit who has no business having it, but they persuaded me viscerally or emotionally in my compromised state. And now I am far, willing, far more willing to have all of my cognitive dissonance erased if I just buy the one big giant lie that is at the heart of this worldview. And so, <clears throat> I mean, that, I can, I'll stop there because I'd rather have a conversation, but I mean, that's like that tippity tip of the iceberg. There's also drops in dopamine and serotonin, uh, boost in norepinephrine and cortisol, all of which tend to, and then when you see a pattern or when you lock into something, you get a dopamine spike. We get drops in serotonin and oxytocin because of our isolation these days in particular. All of those things lead more to paranoid excessive pattern recognition, which is known, known as apophenia. And so our tendency to want and need to, and then even be neurologically primed to, sink our teeth into the most ridiculous shaggy dog story ever and act like it's true because we desperately need it to be is, is potentially higher than ever. Great, thank you. So I think Janelle's question is a good one to drop in right now. Yeah, it's a little bit of a switching gears on you, Jamie, but um, I really just wanna know, how are you doing? And what have you been up to lately? Doing well. Doing well. Just got back from the mountains of Colorado, and we are um, building a global headquarters, an off-the-grid high alpine cabin at 10,000 feet for the Slow Genome Project. We are committing to building out our um, flow camps, so basically a, the baddest-ass elective refugee camp slash Burning Man camp you can think of um, to do summer trainings. And then we're gonna be building on what we've just done. We just wrapped last month with some adventure training in the Utah Canyons and doing more and more adventure training and taking people into wild environments to learn. So for us, it's a beautiful full circle integration of our entire life and everything we care about and uh, cannot wait for 2021. Oh, and finish writing a book, which was super nice to finish. I have edits next week, but until then, I'm a free man. We had a couple of requests in the chat for a quick synopsis of the book. All right, let's see if we can do this in three minutes. Are you guys ready? So, Recaps of the Rapture is, is based on a double play on the word rapture. And the first is that the world is in the grips of rapture ideologies, both fundamentalist and nihilist, the techno utopians, as well as religious extremists. They all share three actually four characteristics, which is the world is fucked. There's an inflection point coming soon. Me and my tribe come up roses, right? Or are better off on the other side of that inflection point. Therefore, let's accelerate towards it as fast as possible and never mind the consequences. And you see that with Mars colonization and, and you know, neural links and, and uploading consciousnesses to Kurzweil's singularity, right? That idea will bypass this train wreck. You see it in new age spirituality. You see it in traditional religious fundamentalism. And so that's the, that it's, the world is being hijacked by all those folks right now. And 99% of humanity is going off the rails with them, but doesn't get a ticket to the after party. So that's a problem. So the question is, how do we write, and this is the, the play on words, which is how do we recapture our lowercase rapture, right? Our healing, our inspiration, and our connection, our Gnostic initiation into being fearful, fearless, joyful, courageous humans. How do we re-get that? How do we get that as soon as possible? So the first, the book is three parts. And it basically is divided into, first is choose your own apocalypse. Like you, you, we're not gonna be helpful to ourselves or each other to make good decisions if we don't have some Bayesian probabilistic estimate of what on earth is happening now. And so it unpacks why where our sense making is broken, um, ways to fix it and where we need to get to is ultimately a form of global centric consciousness in order that we can hold a, we have to have a taste of the cosmos in order to annex a global centric, right? Um, center of gravity, the same way a baby has in order to become egocentric, terrible twos, they actually have to decide there's me and there's mommy, 
right? And once I understand there's the other that's not me, I can annex my fully my identity of this me. So in order for us to be ethnocentric, right, we have to go beyond and sense that there's a world. We have to see there's other tribes in order to have our tribe. And in order to be, have global centric consciousness, we have to go beyond that. We have to have some glimpse of cosmic consciousness by any means necessary, like the flyover effect or like psychedelic experiences or like near-death experiences. How do we scale that? And so that's middle part of the book is what would IDEO, the design firm, do to design meaning 3.0 or conscious transformational consciousness and culture. And, and that's, that's what we're calling the alchemist cookbook. So that's the neurophysiological protocols and the mechanisms of action between harnessing our strongest evolutionary drivers of respiration, embodiments, sexuality, substances, and music in order to be able to reformat a human nervous system. Bang, got that. It's awesome, but it's like not so fast because the moment you start booting that up and you do it with more than one monkey, monkeys get together and form cults. So how on earth do we play with these potent psychotechnologies without putting it in the same old, same old ditches? And so part three is ethical cult building. Here's how you actually do that thing of bonding together in communitas, right? Around ecstasis and catharsis without fucking it up the way we always fuck it up. And then ultimately, what, where, what do we do with that information? How do we start understanding what might be in Tila de Chardin's notion of Christogenesis, right? The Omega point, how do we become team Omega? Because he said that the body of Christ is all of us becoming us aware to ourselves in the neosphere that brings about the omega point, the end of time. And it will be for all the stakes and it will be, and not everybody will be on board. And it's gonna be the greatest story ever told and do we wanna play because we're all needed and it might not even be enough, but a full initiation is that I stand here today and sing my war song, right? And, and nothing but redemption awaits for everyone like that it ha we have to have that balls out level of joyful sacrifice and commitment for a chance to save us all so it's the paradox of becoming twice born like we all have to die now right as soon as possible as thoroughly as possible as as often as needed so that when it's tank men in Tiananmen Square, right? When, it, when it's the marchers on the Selma Bridge, when it's any of those moments, right? Gandhi and the March to the Sea, like it's that soul force only comes when we're dead men or women walking. I just, we watched the Wachowski sisters slash brothers, the, the, the makers of the Matrix and that Natalie Portman film, V for Vendetta. Right, we just rushed it over the weekend, you know, and she gets this Gnostic death birth initiation and V, the one with the Guy Fox mask, says to her, he's like, I, I hated having to do that to you. There was no other way, but now you are free. And that's arguably the premise and the point and the call to action of the whole book with the user manual of how to do it so that we can self-initiate around the world in a sort of Linux open source human expression and uprising of our highest fullest potential like just in time because it's fucking needed and we have to have something that is anti-fragile and scalable and open source and then let a thousand fires burn gordon your i think it's your second question seems to have got the most upvotes and i think i, I really like it it's um the one about uh, cult thinking or conspiracy thinking because i think it is a sure a really um, good one to follow on from what we were talking about before. Yeah, Jamie, um, you know, in line with all of the things that you just presented, um, my own line of thinking is uh, about how do, how do people mature into some of these higher states of consciousness? And um, I wonder if, you know, with your research and perspective on, um, <clears throat> on this kind of, you know, rapturous ideology, rapture thinking and, and cults, do you see that um, attraction to the cults as a natural step on a process that people potentially mature to that stage and then mature past that stage? Or um, is it a sidetrack? Are there, are there ways to, is it a necessary step along the way or at, at least a healthy step along the way? And if so, how do we how do we best progress through it in a healthy fashion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my my first thought was hell no, never, you know, like just like a cul de sac from hell, 
But mm -hmm. the, what, is, what is probably a, a more accurate or nuanced answer is, is that is a pathological expression of a necessary developmental stage, right? So mm -hmm. there is a time when deference to people who know better than I do is a really important part of uh, you know, identity formation, socialization, and just straight up culture 101, not intergenerational knowledge transfer. Like I don't, I'm not going to figure out how to rub two sticks together, but someone else can show me how to make fire. Right. Um, yep. Because granddad was a baller. So that idea of that kind of passing on and belonging and then naturally any family system, right. There's a necessary um, separation and, and identity, you know, self-identification phase. Right. Now the question is, is do, do cults like in the sense of destructive cults? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll even just back up. If, if we're going to talk about cults, we should actually define terms and expand the, the Overton window a bit. So cultus, Latin, just means to worship. So as David Foster Wallace said in that, you know, this is water at speech, like everybody worships. The only question is what? So everybody cults. The only question is how? And if we take historical traditional cults, like if you're a scholar of comparative religion or history, right, you would understand mystery cults, Dionysus, Kali, the Orphic miracles, the Delphic you know, mysteries, any of those things would be mystery cults. Christianity before Emperor Constantine gave it the state sanction was a mystery cult. Right. So the idea is those are traditional cults and the traditional cult typically had the dynamic of here was the here was the exchange. Subjugate yourself to the lineage and you will gain access to the secrets within the secret. Right. Then as we had, you know, basically the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and we had this massive diaspora of the Eastern monastic and mystical traditions to the West, um, we ended up importing a lot of that structure. But now to gurus or teachers that had almost always broken with their lineages. They had almost all, you know, whether, whether it was Osho or, or a self-appointed one like Adida or, or anybody in those systems, or even Aleister Crowley coming out of the Western magic tradition, right? They all went up through the ranks and then said, uh, you know, I am a new covenant. And as a result, the, the promise was subjugation of self, same drill, but now not to a lineage, which is buffered and dampened, right? By elders, by checks and balances, by tradition, ritual, prescription, like we thought the executive branch of the United States was, right? Those kinds of checks and balances ripped out and now you have a guru. So it's subject yourself to a self-appointed God, man, or woman. So that's our culty cult dynamic. And that's what we were almost always meaning when we use the term. And then there's a sort of third, far lesser known, still highly experimental version was what is an ethical cult? So what is an ethical cult where you neither have the authority figure up front or lineage, because this is where in the postmodern, you know, mashup realm, like it or not. And it's no longer about subjugation of the self. It's actually about deepening the sovereignty of the self. And at the same time, heightening the possibilities for creative collaboration. So how can we willingly lose ourselves to the, the Borg, right? But do good things with it and not, and, not, and not give up our center. And that capacity is basically the capacity, if you think of just musicians, right? If you think that traditional cults would have been like playing in an orchestra. There's your seat, there's your instrument, there's your sheet music, here's your part. And if you do all of those things in order the way we tell you, we might make some nice, it'll be actually potentially profound music, but it'll be fucking organized and it won't have a whole lot to do with your discretion or, or input. And then culty cults were like following the marching band, you know, <laughs> following the band leader. Like, here's what I do and what you know, monkey see, monkey do. And, and it's completely guided and steered by that one. And then ethical cults is closer to, to pick up jazz. You know, what happens if you get half a dozen incredibly skilled you know, Miles Davis and John Coltrane, you know, you know, you know, and Art Blakey and a few others around midnight. Like, what can we do? And each of them are fierce talents and forces in, their, in, in and of themselves. And yet there is a thing, the groove, that they collectively agree to subsume themselves to for as long as they are in this specific relationship and this praxis. This is the thing where, where we've agreed mutually to do or explore together. And, when, and, and it's interesting that a lot of rock and roll supergroups failed spectacularly at exactly this. You had Eric Clapton and Stevie Winwood and all the boys from like Cream and Blind Faith and all these things. And they did not actually make better music than those other bands did, even though they should have. 
because that sub that subjugation of self, the voluntary subjugation of self to a co-creative collective emergent field, that is some tricky shit. And not very many people have been particularly good at it outside of, I bet you some capoeira players, right? That notion of an improvisational bodily movement to beats. I bet you those folks have got some meaningful stuff down. Anybody in contact improv and, and kind of the acro yoga balance movement communities start playing in that space, obviously jazz, um, certain team sports in moments, you know, but not always. Very little group consensus decision-making uh, ever gets anywhere near it. Um, and uh, after that, I'm somewhat at a loss. You know, maybe small teams of startups, small certain things where there's the no look pass, you know, like that's the kind of, that's the moment. And of course that's so tempting that many people will give away their center and mistake a culty cult for that. I'm going to come to Xavier. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? So my question was, if you would care to comment on any of the negative aspects of flow as psychotechnologies, are you seeing them being weaponized at all? And should we be you know, aware of that? How should we recognize when we are being captive by flow and not growing. So that was a lot, but I'll just stop there. Yeah, we have a term for that. Basically, bliss junkies and epiphany whores. Right? The bottom line is we can get so hooked on that initial 80% of either ecstatic or cathartic growth um, from our initial 20% investment that we, we neglect to notice we're on a Pareto curve. And then we start chasing what was that asymmetrically high bump we just got, 80% for only 20 points spend. And we assume that that was linear. And then we double down and double down and double down and double down again and again and again, chasing the long tail of our perfection. And as a result, that can become a massive, massive distraction from our dharma or the thing we're shown that's our purpose or ours to do. So in that respect, it becomes massively distracting. And also in, in a world of completely asymmetrical allocation of resources and privilege, it becomes selfish as bougie fuck. You know, it's like, it's like, wake up, see what's ours to do, see where we're broken, patch our bones and get back in the arena because we're needed. And the endless possibility of getting our heads above the clouds where it's just nothing but fluffy rainbows and unicorns while, while, while our brothers and sisters right behind us are struggling to get their heads above water is an unconscionable act of self-indulgence. So 80-20 woke to broke, like wake the fuck up, get your hugs and high fives, you get a long weekend honeymoon, and then get back to your place in the scheme of things. And addictively there, I mean, yes, there's three things, weaponization, commodification, and hedonization, all three massively hijack ecstatic and cathartic territories. They are super sticky and designed and, 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 and able to be co-opted in any of those three ways. So the weaponization, either by state or non-state actors, right? A guru can weaponize ecstatic and cathartic technologies as could MK Ultra, you know, and three letter agencies. Right, so there's that power, which is putting people into state in order to erode their sovereignty. Right, and, and you can make a case that really the psychotechnologies of brainwashing and alchemy are indistinguishable from each other. It is one erodes sovereignty, the other enhances it. Right, and Robert Anton Wilson talked about that. He told the great story of the the uh, the assassins and the old man in the mountain, right? And, and how there were the two initiates who were given opium and hashish and this basically this crazy time release capsule of different substances that led them to fall asleep, be moved to this garden of paradise and earthly delights. Um, you basically danced for and made love to by the most talented courtesans of Egypt, of Cairo, who were then you know, supposed to be Hur Uris, you know, and then woken back up again, back in the king's chamber, in the old man's chamber. And he asked them, he says, what did you see? What did you know? And one of them says, oh, my God, you have showed me paradise and you've promised that I will get back there if I only you know, do your orders. Um, I, I surrender myself to loyal servitude in the, in, the, in the order of the assassins. And he says, go, you know, go and join your brothers. And the other one says, I have understood the ultimate secret of life, that the alchemical elixir is mine and in me and through me and always mine alone. He says, welcome to the Illuminati. Right. And, and so, so that distinction between whether we use these psychotechnologies to enhance sovereignty, to complete the great work, right, of the Western and Eastern traditions of becoming anthropos, of becoming just integrated humans, awake, aware, and alert, decoupled from our genetic imprinting and evolutionary encoding. 
and to say we honor and understand the the neurophysiological substrate upon which our conscious body mind rests and abide and we're decoupling it from the monkey impulses right, that are, that is our imprint and we use those very same techniques and technologies of ecstasy to reformat our nervous system and our psychological maps and models and meaning making such that we can stably hold post-conventional multi-perspectival consciousness without losing our wits or our tits. So there are three forms of addiction that come in this space. The first is physical, physiological addiction. The next is psychological addiction. And, the, and we know those dynamics, right? Physical withdrawal up to illness, injury, and death, DTs, opium withdrawal, those kinds of things. Psychological addiction, quite often cannabis and certain other substances or behaviors, or maybe online shopping, video games, those sorts of things. So still can be quite sticky, um, but just don't end up in a biological downregulation in, in their absence and typically increasing dose to response curves, right? Um, but the third category is super important, especially in the realms of uh, the, the, just the spike in non-ordinary state seeking, um, whether that's flow states, whether that's immersive VR, whether that's Wim Hof and, and Vipassana to psychedelic renaissance to, you know, neo-tantra to you name it really across that spectrum. And, and that is ontological addiction. So physiological, psychological, ontological, and that is, oh my God, I just found the wishing well. And what I am seeing there is so novel and so important. And what I must be, in fact, by commu the commutative property, so novel and so important that I cannot help but go back because I have a world-saving mission. And the capacity for that one to snooker many folks, if, you're, if anyone's curious about what is the kind of weird signal around ketamine, right? On the one hand, people are like, yay, it's the best thing since sliced bread for depression and anxiety and everything else. And everyone's like, whoo our doctor is finally going to give us the good, the, the, you know, the special K. And, and sort of in between is this sort of weird, slightly gothic undertone for that drug. And the stories, the cautionary tales of the people who have dabbled deeply in it, like John Lilly. Like there's a number of, there's a number of black cats in that particular matrix. And a big part of the reason, and this is where the contempt, you know, the current medicalization model is just woefully inadequate is the fact that you get into that dom those domains and you can believe that it is so gobsmackingly non-ordinary, exceptional and important that you lose yourself. It's like Dumbledore when Harry stumbles across the mirror of Ezered, right? Which is desire spelled backwards. And, and Harry sees his dead parents and Dumbledore comes and puts his hand on his shoulder. He says, careful, Harry. He says, men have wasted away for their entire lives staring at that thing. So I would say that is I mean, the other two are known factors and will persist. But the third is increasingly an issue, especially as you cross-reference that with the collapse in epistemic certainty, the rise of magical thinking and cultic tendencies. And then that as a potential, you know, panacea slash deal with the devil. Awesome. Cool. Thank so, you. The, the next question I'd like to ask Nat Hollywood to uh, unmute yourself and ask. Brings it nicely down to earth. I, I think it's a really good question. Our thinking can be great, but our emotional, our, our, our emotional intelligence can be, can be kind of uh, out of whack. And that's when our kind of interpersonal relationships seem to break down. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I feel as though you are very powerfully eloquent intellectually about emotional experiences so, but does that translate into your relationships? Because for me, they are the kind of the benchmark of our emotional, our emotional, let's call emotional a scope, emotional scope, because the, the more emotional scope we have, then, then the more kind of like open we are in our, in our relationships. And then the more intellectual scope we have, the more we can, we kind of think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So you're asking basically, is there a there, there? Or is this all hot air, right? And so, well, so I the, feel like you don't want to talk about your interpersonal relationships because that's not what you're here to talk about. Oh well, I mean, obviously, the particulars of my partner Julie and our children and things like that won't necessarily be relevant, but I'm happy to share them in the sense that they are helpful. And well, no, well, it, well, it, well, it, it's that if if you're as your thinking changes 
as you as you evolve in the way that you think and 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 you writing books so you write a book and then you you say well, this is a, a, a perspective i have and your perspective grows and changes does that change yeah, of course or, we're yeah. divorcing all our friends so how's that right yeah. so i mean and, and not not our dear ones but we are finding a a palpable yes. like fucking needle across the record yes. on who are living surrendered lives of people who are not and, and you can all be hanging out at the same parties. You can all be wearing the same fucking fancy clothes, right? But there's a question of, are you still a hungry ghost? Are you still eating? And, and now we're all getting closer to source. So now there's even more to jockey around in position. And the question is, is that going to animate and reify your previously identified self? Or is this going to pass through you in service to that which you are attempting forever to align? And so... In the people for the people we love, we're humans and we wound each other the most who we love the most, right? I mean, Diane Hamilton, who many of you probably know, shared this with me a decade ago, but she's like, you know, you wound your baby when you pick them up and if they're crying. And you wound them if you let them be when they're crying. To love someone is to wound them. So all we've committed to in, the, in my central relationships, I've been with my wife since I was 18. Our entire life has been built together and Julie and my, our children are the rate limiter filter from anything I'm permitted to speak of. So the fact that I might sometimes like if I'm hanging out with Daniel and Jordan or even John, I feel like I'm like the USA today. You know, I feel like I'm like pictures and comics and pretty, you know, and simple captions. And then on the other hand, it's, it's not that, um, that kind of cognitive complexity and linguistic and semantic uh, you know, nuance is not unavailable. It's that it's much more that, does it grow corn? And, and what, is, what is the weakest link? Therefore, the actual center of gravity of, of integration from which to speak with actual word sound power, right? With logos, with, with like, like that, that Rasta term, you know, of, of word sound power is, is, is logos expressed. And so we could fucking monkey around up here at a mile a minute and it wouldn't be the same and, and we've experienced a thinning of logos over time, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was everything. Bam, instantiation of reality down to now where we have Instagram memes. And for 99% of the experience of homo sapiens, right? That logos was verbalized, it was vocalized, it was, it was expressed and received and perceived via vagal nerves and hominid nervous systems and then gutenberg cow suddenly you know hieroglyphics a little bit but like gutenberg bam symbols divorced from word sound power now on a page right and that was still high quality it was scripture it was it was it was literature and fiction and history and everything it, it moved the world but it was a reduction massively compared to what what is now what can only be expressed via an integrated anthropos like we are who we are no hiding. So my sense, I mean, I tried to buck this. I was like, beam me up to the mothership or let me just write about it. And that was 10 years ago. And the answer I got irrevocably then, clear as a bell, on the sides of Mount Shasta, funnily enough, like ski, ski mountaineering, was you can only bring through what you can live and you got to fucking live everything you care about or you don't get to talk about it. So we may be shared less um, because of that seeming... Uh, constraint, but I don't regret it either. I don't think it would, I mean, this is a wild enough thing to try and land as it is. And if it wasn't three legs balanced and grounded in relationship, I mean, that's the thing, like the ecstasis, catharsis, those peak experiences, seeing the world, mapping infinity, the catharsis, the deep healing and all those kind of things that can become addictive. That can become distortionary. That can become um, a cul-de-sac unless it's mediated through our intimate relationships. Because our bleeding, our, our leading edges, right? Where does the cutting edge of our most recent breakthrough and transformation or insight and aha, it has to be counterbalanced by the, the people, our stakeholders, the people we love and support in, in our, our tribe from their bleeding edge, where they, or where they have been hurt or traumatized or where we have hurt or traumatized them, you know, even more importantly. So our leading edge versus their bleeding edge means we're forever out of phase and out of time in the deep now in true communion with each other unless or until we atone 
for our bleeding edges. And we come back down from the mountain with helping hands and humility to actually shuttle shit right where we left it such that those people holding trauma around us, basically the receivers of our karma, can in fact stand tall and find our new future selves trustworthy and consistent enough to allow them to release and leave behind all those, all that lost gold and then join us in the deep now. But if we're forever just pretending that our latest greatest breakthrough is our actual center of gravity and it's a fucking forgive all debts jubilee, you know, because of our latest epiphany, then we set up pathologies for not staying in relationship uh, as we go and as we grow. So there's a question that follows on from this a little bit from Kay. Uh, she's asked me to ask it for her. Can you say more about Heros Gamos, the sacred union? I saw an interview with your wife about it on a channel called Relationship School done two years ago. I just looked at it today. Are you following a teacher? Or are you making it up as you go along? I think it's a really fascinating subject. I mean, the long story short is, okay, so uh, Julie, my partner and I have been together for 30 years. And as a result, we decided, or more to the point, didn't decide. We so almost didn't get to decide. It was simply was the way it was, was that the container of our relationship was really important, was sacrosanct. And as a result, we then committed to digging one well as deeply as we could versus a thousand wells a foot deep. So that obviously led to some deep curiosity around um, Western sex magic, you know, Crowley and Israel Rigotti and that kind of neck of the woods, Gurdjieff, any, any, anybody in that kind of Western tradition and also the, obviously this kind of the Eastern uh, Tibetan and, you know, uh, uh, Hindu tantras. And none of them um, really caught our fancy because they had totally functional protocols, but they were wrapped in all sorts of esoterica and handed down, I mean, I suppose mythologies or ontologies of what it all meant. And then what, it, and then what were you doing, but wrapped in ritual and God, and then, and then what does it actually affect? And so we, I, we were just, well, it's definitely me for sure, um, was most interested in what, what are just the simple protocols? How does this actually fucking work? And then let us skin it in the way that's most elegant for us. So started exploring that, started having it disclosed. It became a sort of self-disclosing inquiry, actually. So basically all you need is like the first three moves and then the next, and then the third move will tell you the fourth move and so on infinitum. So it is, it is a very interesting autodidactic pro, uh, you know, protocol. Um, but what we realized is we found ourselves getting pulled into this super interesting domain. This is that whole, I'm, I, not, I haven't written this part of the story, but I've written all about the subject matter in this forthcoming book, uh, Recapture the Rapture, um, which is basically boils down to a sexual yoga of becoming. Um, and what we realized is, is that um, we went to look at like Burning Man tribes, polyamorous communities on the West Coast. We're like, okay, some, I mean, we're country bumpkins. We stumbled across this shit who are the pros? Like who's actually knows what's going on about this whole scene? Cause clearly there's no way in hell us just literally accidentally uh, learning to start fire over here are anywhere near what state of the art is. And as it turned out, an awful lot of the people who are the most sexy, sexy, you know, psychedelic conscious burner tribe kind of stuff were actually the furthest away. It was like one of those placemats at a diner, you know, that you give to the kids with a crayon and they have to try and find the maze. And invariably like the straightest route outside out to the gate is never the way out. And it always leaves you stuck. And it's, it's as if that kind of super, super conchy Bali Tulum, you know, West coast kind of scene appears from all, you know, outside observers to be right fucking there at the Stargate. And the reality is, is 99% of them are encased in plexiglass and will never see the other side. And so what we became interested in is um, we're all consenting adults and it's the 21st century. So relational format's not the point. Like overwhelming amount of the conversation is polyamory, monogamy, serial monogamy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And everybody's setting up straw men of the other one, other situations. And then, and then, and then, you know, grandstanding about the merits of their own without the drawbacks. So it's just, it's not a helpful conversation. And in some respects, it's not even actually the point. So it's not monogamos, right? It's hieros gamos. It, it, it's not which is your relational format. It's how far into the garden gate are you getting? What are you seeing? And what are you bringing back? 
And hieros gamos back in the Greek just means sacred union, hierogamy. So we can literally, you know, replace the, the, the clunky uh, old fashioned language and just call it higher agami. What is the art of connection and dyadic union in yoga that allows you to disclose the numinous? So that's kind of it. I mean, there's a good jillion things more underneath that, but I'll, I'll pause there for any questions or follow-ups. Awesome. So let's see whether David Hagar is on the call. David, are you, are you here? I'm here. Excellent. Would you like to ask your question? <clears throat> yeah. Um, this is a wonderful conversation, by the way. I'm just sitting here just blissing out on all this cool stuff. Um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe I can work my question into the context here, which is that, you know, people, when they encounter a lot of this stuff, get launched into a place and they start feeling all of this stuff, right? Whether it be flow states and meditation or like whatever. And, and there is a mystery there. It is kooky and bizarre and like this thing that you were talking about just now with Hyros Gamos. I mean, you know, a lot of people are probably going to read the book and like try a bunch of stuff and they're going to get launched into this space and it's going to be new and mysterious. Like, and, and you were talking about how that can get hijacked into cults and, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 myth mythological frames and religious contexts and all kinds of other stuff and it shows yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right and and i think there is this natural thing to just say okay i need a system for this i need a way of like make you know do i do i sit and be patient and just try to make sense of it is this science do i do to go to neurochemistry like like what what is the roadmap for coming back down to ground from all of the weirdness mm -hmm. and getting something real. Yeah, very simple, embodiment, relationship, and service. That's it. So can you, can you tell me what those are so that I don't fill in my own gaps? Like what, 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 are, what are those? I mean, yogic practice of whatever, kinesthetic modality you know you jam with so get in your skin and get your body into the present moment so if you have outdated kinks and imbalances if you have accumulated pollution detritus right get to the present in your body and then relationship what we were just talking about earlier mediated through subject object i thou or it's nothing right or it's just solipsism so we have to be able to ground it in our humanity and we find that in our mutuality and then finally, service. Just get the fuck over both of those st steps and get back out in the world and relate to those who have um, maybe not yet nor ever um, been graced with what you have, you know, uh, accepted. And then it doesn't even fucking matter if it works. You're still being a decent human. So it's a very good, you know, lowest common denominator backstop to this whole process. And I mean, like think of the yogas and I mean, all of them service, you know, karma yoga, everything, you know, monastic traditions in the West, it's all the same. It's only lately that we've, we've propped up this cult of individual perfectibility as the end game. And it's not. And Maslow, even himself, you know, unpublished later letters talked about the stage above self-actualization, which unfortunately became the pinnacle of the, the pyramid for the boomers. And it isn't it's the, it's the penultimate. And the final one was self-transformation, which he defined as selfless service, a return to selfless service. So that's your filter. That's our mediator. It's not what is the back of beyond whispering in your ear on a Saturday night. Hmm. And that's interesting. Can I follow up a little bit? So, so it's not about like science. It's not about getting to the root of what the thing is. It's about how you use it. Well, look, I, mean, I, can what it, right now, what I can tell you right now, here's the cheat codes to the universe, right? You get high vagal nerve tone. You take your brain down into delta wave stakes. You super saturate, you engage, yeah, you engage your vagal nerve, 
you adjust your respiratory posture, you supersaturate with oxygen, your red bloodstream, you engage in gas assisted uh, hyperventilatory apnea, you engage nitrous oxide, cannab can cannabis uh, and, and or ketamine, and you time it with pleasure pain stimulation and orgasm and driving sonic beats. You too will spend three to 10 minutes in the information realm. And you can think anything you want about anything you can think of with a 300 IQ for as long as you're there. You can also use that energy and information to discharge um, and basically, literally, I mean, it, it is a brainstem level reset at the level of the trigeminal node. So you're basically cold rebooting your computer and, bait and having some hybrid of a lucid dream and a near-death experience. There's your science. Now, what the fuck do you do with that for the rest of your life? And, and with the burden of the information you receive therein, Therein is the rub. Okay, okay. So if anyone missed those detailed instructions, it was recorded, so you can go back <laughs> over it and transcribe it. Your own. <laughs> <laughs> Caveat tripor, it's a doozy. Oslem, would you like to ask your, your question? Sure, I was uh, going to ask uh, about your metaphysics for coming up a uh, book, and uh, if you could just give us some... Uh, taste of what to expect <laughs> well let's think i mean there's even a meta metaphysics in it which so so like how to make sense of post-conventional sense making um but yeah i mean um this is just this is actually somebody asked me how i make sense of things i didn't i didn't have it thought up ahead of time and i just blurted out i said oh it's a three-legged stool it's pascal's wager occam's razor and bayesian probability Right. And that was just that sense of, huh, well, better to believe in God just in case he's true than burn in hell for my doubts, like Pascal. So better con to consider the inconceivable just in case. And the just in cases could be, well, huh, is QAnon right? Is there, a, is there a satanic cabal of, you know, sex criminals running the world? Maybe. I mean, maybe. You know, like, it's definitely worth at least saying maybe to. Right. The same with, huh, is the vaccine situation or, hmm, is Jem Bendel really right? And we're actually, you know, we've got less than a decade for civilization. Like, hmm, better to consider these things than to blow them off and get bitten in the ass. Step one. Right. So that gives us permission to have fairly open, curious minds. The next is, is um, Occam's razor. Occam's and that's razor. Basically, yeah. So basically just do not, do not get tempted by overly Baroque explanations <laughs> If there's a simpler, cleaner, right. more obvious solution, like they were lying or I'm on drugs, right? Like you can, you can, you can for sure go with those more yeah. often than not. And like Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So bars are fucking high easy. on the deep weirdness, right? And then the yeah. final one is, is Bayesian probability, which is just the idea of complex situation and we don't know. So let's identify all the variables we can and update them dynamically over time with the most accurate data we have at the time. And then make our provisional decisions knowing that it's not certain and knowing that it's always in flux. And the general rule of thumb is delay action for as long as possible so that you have the highest quality information possible. So basically it's like Tai Chi. You always, if you're gonna place your foot, you wanna be balanced enough and centered enough that you can also pick up that foot, right? So that's a simple one. There's also like three bucket ontology and how you can play with it, the, the gathering stuff that you collect. Um, actually, do I have two minutes? Do I have one minute? Do I? Yes, I'll tell you what. Three bucket ontology, you guys down? So in a nutshell, uh, bucket number one is the stuff they told us in grade school and Sunday school, consensus reality. Bucket number two is all the whack ass shit you might encounter in a, in a life of adventure and mystery, but you don't change your name or quit your day job. So it's stuff you keep up on your favorite shelf. And then bucket number three is full bore red pill territory, friends. If you if you pop that bad boy, nothing is the same. You're in, the entire physics of reality is topsy turvy, and you will be making decisions that appear utterly deranged or insane to anybody around you once you've accepted this new reality. So the name of the game is a understand. There's different buckets. It's not all one thing, and a lot of times people just fuse them. And otherwise, rational people start making whack-ass decisions based on a viral snippet of magical thinking. So keep your buckets. Understand that the goal is over time to go from law, like in geometry, to, th to uh, theorem, to postulate or hypothesis, right? So the, the bucket number three stuff is my hypothesis, my, my, my theorems. I wonder, maybe. Bucket number two is, huh, I think this has happened often enough. I'm beginning to take it as an orienting generalization. And 
Bucket number one is basically law. This is consistently reliable enough that I actually, I trust it without ever having to test it repeatedly before subsequent use. And the name of the game is, can I just take some stuff from bucket number two over time? I test it enough. I'm like, I think I believe in this. And you can take stuff of whack ass stuff from bucket number three and be like, I think this is kind of up on my shelf now. I keep this under advisement. And bucket number three is honestly something you would want to stiff arm for as long as you possibly can, because having to reconcile those worlds becomes increasingly problematic for folks and can often prompt psychic distress or breakdown unless they have supportive environments to do so. All right. And just before we unmute ourselves and say thank you and goodbye to Jamie, we are going to have an after hours. So, Kim, would you like to say something? You're going to lead the after hours session after a short bathroom break in a second. Yeah, we're just going to uh, take a, uh, a little break and then come back. And anybody who wants to stick around and, and keep uh, jiving on all of this hot stuff, which is incredible. Um, so we'll, we'll have a little bit of sharing and then just discussion. Um, so anybody who wants to stick around. Awesome. Yeah, plenty to talk about from, from this session. Thank you, Jamie. And if anyone, everyone would like to unmute themselves and say thank you, I will. Thanks, Jamie. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.